next corner, and a cab stopped. And he said, I only take two of you, and there were four of us. So the two ladies got in the cab, and we put all the luggage in the cab, and then we waited for about 20 minutes, and we got a cab, got back to the hotel, had a drink, talked about the evening, how cool everything was. And then I was mentioning something I'd just shot, funny enough, fashion film. I said, oh, we'd love to see it. And I said, oh, it's on my computer, and let's go to my room and see it. And I said, as we entered my room, I do apologize for the mess. Um, where's my computer? Um, Rosie, where's my computer? You know, we didn't have a computer. I said, no, we put it in the taxi. No, no, I wasn't in the taxi. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Everything I've ever written is on the computer. There's no password. Um, Everything. You know that <laughs> you know the feeling, right? Um, right now I'm really philosophical about it. <clears throat> um, having a virtual Apple store moment at the latest, I'll just get another one, you know. But um, it's a very strange feeling that it's on the one hand that it's out there, on the other hand, fuck it, it's out there, right? You know, <clears throat> I don't have to publish it now, it'll just turn up on the internet somehow. Um, so yeah. So um, fashion. Films um, are pretty much the same as feature films. Um, the bigger the budget gets, uh, the less capable anybody is of making up their mind about anything. Um, the less the budget is, the more freedom you have. It tends to be the better the product for me. Um, it is stunning the similarity. This maybe based on a fear of if you say yes, it's great. Someone might kill you a month later for having been the person that publicly said, yes, it was a great idea, and somebody else thought it wasn't. And there's such an insecurity in the fashion industry as there is in the movie industry. I guess because the bottom line is it's all about capitalism, it's all about, it's not about just the pure creative process, although that's in both cases an essential part of everything. Um, it's the money that makes people really insecure, and the fact that your product whether you admit it or not, ultimately it's designed to sell knickers, bras, dresses, whatever. Um, so it's a pretty strange thing. I, you know, I, I've, I've had a very comfortable transition, if you like, psychologically, from the one to the other. Um, and my affair with fashion, I think, started in a closet sense when I was a teenager, and I secretly bought French Vogue at a time when my fellow school brothers were buying uh, Playboy and Spank and stink and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and I thought, man, these photographs are so cool. Who is this guy? Guy Bordino Bordin. So I just I had no idea who Guy Bordin was until more recently. Um, and some amazing photographers. And I think the thing, looking back on a lot of those images now that I think I found inspiring as a visual artist was that they, and I was doing performance art at that time, was that they all referred back to a certain kind of filmmaking that was very powerful. Um, there seemed to be the ability to imply inherent storyline in the image. When you look at the early Helmut Newton stuff, certainly the keyboard and stuff, and, so, and many other photographers of that period. And I find now the tendency is just to copy that period without the inherent story. As someone's like, you, who needs story anymore? It's like Lady Gaga, who needs to sing? You just need to copy the copy copy. And a little bit kind of cultural saturation, maybe, I don't know if you find this a little bit of a problem right now. Um, the films that I've chosen to show are mainly short, but there's a longer one, which is, uh, I guess, my first serious foray into uh, proper fashion, which was, I think about 15 years ago now, my stepdaughter was working for Vivian Westwood, and she said, you know, she's, she's doing this amazing show in Paris. And no one's documenting it, and she's too busy. You should, you should document it. So I did. I came to Paris. Um, it was an amazing show. It certainly opened my eyes to, to a lot of stuff about fashion. It's very funny working for Vivian Westwood. She is, as you know, quite eccentric. I showed she had no interest in the film. She was completely bored by the idea. She just, I think it was the same show that, she, that was used as the basis for Preda Porte, the, the Robert Altman film. So it's exactly the same clothes and so on. And she was already pissed off with Altman and did, hated what he did and so just doesn't understand fashion, but, which is probably true. 
And um, so anyway, I quietly made the film and I quietly cut it. And then I showed it to her and then she kind of got interested. And she watched the film intently and then the credits came up and I said, what do you think of it? And she went, well, I like it, but there is one thing. And I went, what's that? She said, it says directed by nine figures. And I went, well, it was. And she went, but they're my clothes. <laughs> and I said, but it's my film. And she went, all right then. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> Taken back a little bit. Uh, I think the first clip that's up is a commercial I did for Givenchy. Again, a uh, wonderful example of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, hilarious working with combinations of creatives, the actual company themselves, the way they don't talk to each other, the way they send messages via the runners that would it be possible to have another inch of this or you know, more light or less light and so on. Hilarious. But no one ever actually has a direct conversation with anybody else. Um, but I was pleased sort of with the result, although it didn't finally represent what I thought it should be. Um, then um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure of the sequence of all of this, but there's a, a Kate Moss clip. At a certain point, I got so pissed off with the advertising industry and actually the advertising agencies, which is driving me fucking insane. Uh, this idea of creatives, I don't know if there's any creatives in the room, and of course, I don't mean you. I mean the other creators, <laughs> but otherwise, I mean, they're not here and it's self-explanatory, right, because they're not cool. But um, these people who kind of um, become, in a way, the block, the big block between you and actually the source, which seems to be such a waste of energy. And it's kind of a legacy of the 60s and the period of the advertising agencies having some creatively sort of exploded. But it's kind of out of date. And particularly now with the uh, new media and everything, I mean, you really don't need the middle people getting in the way. You should really, someone wants to sell some baked beans, go, go to the baked beans directly, you know? So I thought I would try this. So I went to Agent Provocateur, who, of course, it's a blood lineage. It's Joe is the daughter, son, whoops, of uh, Vivian, and was a friend. So I said, you know, do you, what do you have in your budget, you know, for advertising? He said, we already spent it. So what, what have you got left? He said, like £5,000. And I said, okay, I'll make a film for you for £5,000 for the internet. No agency, nothing. Just give me the money and I'll make you a film. So I made a kind of faux French blue movie called Tyler for the Office. <clears throat> and their website crashed. Um, in other words, it did well for them. And uh, so then they came back and said, how about doing something with Kate? You know, so I came up with the idea of this series called The Four Dreams of Miss X. It's about knickers, right? It's about knickers and lingerie and selling it. And again, I had complete freedom. Um, and they also, uh, they had the budget was, I think, I don't know, maybe 50,000 or something for the four films and the stills campaign for that whole range that Kate then modeled. And we shot it in two nights and did all the stills in the daytime. So the whole thing was done. And actually, it's very hard work. But it was a joy because there were no creators there at all. And they just basically turned up and styled and I shot it, you know. And I shot the whole thing in the dark on night vision, so the lighting budget was tiny. Um, and, uh, and then put the films out. Again, their website completely crashed and their sales went through the roof. And I, I'm led to believe by various articles that I read after that it kind of changed the approach to lingerie um, in terms of using celebrities to wear the knickers and so on. Um, and it's funny, you know, you do these things, and I did the same in the, in the film world, leaving Las Vegas, completely not a studio film, no American money, you know, done on a shoestring, shot in two and a half weeks. It was the most successful film I've ever made, and I had final cut. But I seem to find it more and more difficult to persuade either a studio or a company that this is a better way for you to go. Don't go through intermediaries, you know, go, just give me a, a brief and some money and I'll do it for you. Um, another of the films is, um, there's only 23 of them or something, I'm joking, <laughs> four or five. It's called Met Steps. I was asked to make a little documentary, like a five minute um, testimonial documentary for Candy Pratt's Prize for the CFDA Awards, which was hilarious, because I got to then almost strangle Anna Winter unintentionally. Um, 
I notice no one laughs, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> I do. That's the terror of that <laughs> um, And, uh, but what happened was that two of the people I had to interview, some supermodel and somebody else, weren't available, but were coming to the Met Ball, and they said, we'll give you a spot on the steps, and you can just grab them, and they can just say how much they love candy, and then you can fuck off after that. And I thought, actually, I, I, I'm never happier than I'm with the paparazzi, and just actually grabbing stuff as it goes by. So I, met, I actually filmed the whole entrance of the Met Steps, and secretly made a little, this was not for Vogue, but for me, as I'd never been shown, I thought you, you might be amused to see that. And then the final one is, um, I collaborate a lot with Boudicca, who um, also collaborate with Rosie Chan. So I made a little short video of a Philip Glass piano piece where the both she and the dancer are wearing Boudicca. So um, I think that's it. And as I said, I'll be around if anybody wants to ask any questions. If you don't, I won't be offended either. Um, immediately afterwards.